So uh, Alan Schuldiner, you want to, uh unfortunately couldn't make it, so I was asked at the last minute to pinch hit. Um, many of you who have heard me speak know that I like to either quote classic rock or a movie in every talk, and I didn't have time to put in a slide. Uh, but it occurs to me that uh, for those of you who know the Princess Bride, Alan would be Wesley, uh, and I think that makes me Prince Humperdinck, the alternative to suicide, and I think that makes Mark Princess Buttercup. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's me. The other point I'll make is that, yes, I did intentionally wear the same shirt as Les, and that's to highlight Rex's point about the difference between clinical and research being very, very hard to, to truly tell. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I got my pointer. So two disclosures. I am a paid consultant to Medco Health Solutions on their uh, laboratory and therapeutics committee. I don't think that makes any difference here today. Uh, but another important disclosure that I'll factor into what I'm going to tell you is that I'm one of three co-editors-in-chief and founders of a new resource called GeneFacts. GeneFacts is intended to be the resource that is more generally useful for clinicians at the point of care, not so detailed as the traditional genetics resources, but more useful for the typical general medical use resources. The other point I realized that I meant to make at the top is that for anyone who desperately needs the bathroom or a cup of coffee, I'll tell you now the summary of what I'm going to tell you. As a clinician, tell me what I need to do, make it quick and easy to find, and preferably make it accurate and reliable. That's it. If you need to go to the bathroom, you got my main point. <laughs> Back to gene facts, though, and, and the concept that Les pointed out about the perspective versus a perspective. One of the principles that we've been using in trying to build gene facts is rather than taking the, um, uh, the, the thought that we as experts know what everyone else needs to know, we've tried to go out to anticipated users and ask them, well, what do you want so that we can actually build something useful? Uh, and with that in mind, what I tried to do is instead of stand up here and tell you what I think is a useful resource, because I am a geneticist, and like most of the rest of you, if not all of you, we geneticists already know what's wrong with the existing databases. You don't need me to tell you that. I think what we need to talk about is what do non-geneticist clinicians need to know. So with that in mind, I figured, okay, let's collect some data. So I did a survey, and I have to air my dirty laundry. My IRB approval was, ah, it's last minute, I'd like to get some data, so I'm not going to go to the IRB. Uh, informed consent was minimal. I sent out an email, and I said, I'm giving a talk tomorrow. Can you answer a couple questions for me? So they knew what they were getting into. They knew I was going to give a talk and present the data. Subjects were, by and large, my colleagues at Johns Hopkins, with a few exceptions. So this is an academic primary care selection of clinicians, made up in part of clinician educators who are actually taking care of patients, some of whom know some genetics, most of whom don't consider themselves expert in genetics, some of whom are also clinician researchers, seeing patients half a day a week, but mostly doing research. And you might think that researchers are going to think about things a little bit differently than clinicians. But again, the line is blurred. Researchers do see patients, and clinicians do occasionally dabble in research, sometimes with dangerous consequences. So the recruitment period that I listed here was seven hours yesterday. As of half an hour ago, though, I got two more responses. So we'll stretch it out to about 16 to 18 hours of data collection. So I asked two questions. The first was, and these are actually the questions that were in the original email to Alan, so I'm just kind of picking up and trying to give his talk. What resource or resources do or would you turn to if you want more information about the significance or management of a genetic variation? I rephrased the question a little bit, but that's, that's what I asked my survey respondents. And the second one was, well, what do you want? What would the ideal resource provide for you? Um, so the next point is that just like I can dress up in a suit and make myself look presentable, that adds some authority to what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you data from a highly biased, small set of data that is completely unscientific. But I've dressed it up really nicely in a pretty table. <laughs> and that makes it look much more relevant. And, and while I'm intentionally trying to make you laugh, I think it's an important point that when grading the, the value of the evidence and what to do, if something is presented in a neat, organized way and looks really slick, it carries a lot more authority than a guy in a t-shirt and shorts saying, yeah, I think that would be a good idea. So here's what I found. Um, there were 16 respondents as of last night. Now there are 18. And not surprising to anyone who actually does clinical care, the first and most commonly listed resource was up to date by half of respondents. And in fact, there's one more who responded this morning that also listed up to date, uh, equally distributed among the researchers and clinicians. The next most common source that people went to 
was a consultant. Pick up the phone, walk down the hall, and ask the expert. And Elaine made the point of don't oversimplify, but as a clinician, the clinicians out there want it simplified. They don't want it oversimplified, but dumb it down. Give it to me simple. After that, after UpToDate, which is a internet-based primary care subscription resource, all right, so at Hopkins, our institution buys it, we have it. I'm not sure that the family doc in Idaho has access to all the same resources that we in major academic institutions have. After that, an expert. After that is general internet resources. Google and Wikipedia are the most common places people go. And frankly, I sometimes go there myself. Not wiki, but certainly Google. After that, you then get into true primary literature. And note that only two of the clinician educators mentioned going to PubMed or Google Scholar, although one of the responses this morning also listed PubMed. All the rest of the people who are going to primary literature and guidelines were people who are self-designated as researchers more than, than, uh, than primary clinicians. And then the next group is uh, specialty internet sites, the NIH sites, OMIM, Gene Test, Gene Reviews, and my own database, Gene Facts. You'll see asterisks throughout here. Those are on the next slide. I'll explain them in a moment. Um, and there was one no answer, uh, but I'll add to that one of the responses this morning was a little bit more specific than no answer. The answer from this other respondent this morning was, I don't think there's a resource out there that tells me what I need to know in a useful and accessible manner. So the asterisks, footnotes, qualifiers, etc. One of the people who said Google actually shows up in there twice, and this was a slightly more sophisticated answer. So that person actually goes to Google, but uses a fairly smart search. So it says NIH and the mutation that that person is looking for. So that's at least trying to put some scientific value on what they're looking for. The NIH answers, one of them was that Google search that I just mentioned. The other one was some NIH polymorphism database, which I assume the respondent meant dbSNP, but I don't know for sure, and the respondent didn't know the name of the database. But at least there was a concept among one, and that was a clinician, by the way, that was over here, not a researcher. Uh, someone at least was aware that the NIH has some sort of a database. Hadn't actually gone there, but thought that, that, that it might be a useful resource. The people who said gene facts and gene reviews are in fact my other two co-editors in chief, so another... <laughs> Another flaw in the study is that anonymity is clearly not preserved, because if you know or can figure out who we are, then I've just called out the other two people. Among the people who listed OMIM, uh, so there was one more vote for OMIM, so now we have a total of, of four people who mentioned OMIM. Three of those four said they would use it. One specifically said, I would definitely not go to OMIM, because it's way too dense and I can't get what I need. Of the people who mentioned OMIM, uh, one is a, one of the co-editors in chief of GeneFacts, and the one who said that OMIM would not be used, in fact, is the other co-editor in chief of GeneFacts. Uh, and then the, the notes of H or HH or HHH, that was the number of times that someone commented, I might use that resource, but it's really hard to find what I want within that resource. So that's the uh, results of my highly unscientific, biased, irrelevant study. What does the literature say? Pretty much the same thing. Clinicians like to get their data from the internet. This is old data, so CD-ROM was listed. I'm not sure that's as often a place that people will turn anymore. Textbooks don't really exist anymore, but maybe you'll look it up on your Kindle. Uh, consultants and specialists remain highly desired sources of information. Seminars, meetings, other things as well. People in general, especially highly active clinicians, don't like to go to lectures because it takes up time. They don't t uh, go to the journals and primary literature, again, because it takes up time. And generally don't actually go to specific guidelines, although as we'll talk about later, they do by some osmosis filter in some of the advice from their governing bodies or, or society statements. Other resources that I use that didn't get called out in that database, I certainly go to PharmGKB. A few years ago, I would tell people it's like OMIM. It's a dense encyclopedia, but not so clinically useful. That's gotten better in recent years. And importantly, the CPIC, Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, which Alan would have told you a lot more about uh, were he here, um, and other guidelines on that site are actually making it much more user-friendly for the clinician. I often will go to the website of a specialty lab or call up the specialty lab. So Elaine, sorry, the pressure you're feeling is true. Once you make a call, we're going to um, assume that you've made the correct call. So yeah, the clinical lab has to get it right. And likewise, we'll go to the researchers sometimes. Uh, so the researchers have to get this right. I still love the Flockhart tables. Um, and there's a website there for it, uh, for you. Uh, that's slowly collecting some, some actual 
clinical variant data, uh, but even without that, there's still useful lists of what genes are, uh, I'm sorry, what uh, drugs are metabolized through what P450 enzymes. Uh, and then algorithms for decision support. Uh, Warfarindosing.org, I think most of you are familiar with, and hopefully there'll be more of those coming online as we get more clinically relevant data. Uh, I should point out the results of the needs analysis study we did several years ago uh, to show that we should build gene facts. Uh, we didn't ask questions about, can you look up a specific genetic variant? But we did write what we thought were 20 reasonably relevant questions in clinical genetics, and we interrogated nine different databases to see if they could answer those questions completely and accurately. And what we found was the, the genetics resources, especially gene reviews, were good. Up to date was the best of the non-genetics resources, and most of the others really weren't good enough. And really distressingly, some of the resources had wrong answers. My favorite, which most of you are probably familiar with, some of them explicitly stated that you can only inherit hereditary breast ovarian cancer, BRCA mutations, through the maternal lineage, and you don't have to worry about the paternal side. Black and white, clear statement of fact. Yikes. Second question, what would the ideal resource provide? I got 12 responses to this. Characteristics of the resource. First and foremost, it has to be concise, easy to use. I've got to get in and get out fast. And it also needs to be accurate. Free is desirable. Educational was listed as something desirable. Someone just said something like up to date, by which I presume they meant put the actual genetic variant data in there and make it so that I can find it. Uh, and one person wanted links to other resources, which we saw highlighted in one of the other talks already. As far as the content, give me management information, give me the clinical significance, tell me what it means. That was four responses. And I listed separately because I think it's important to note, but that's really part of management. One person actually specifically called out, give me clinical, data support, clinical decision support right within the EHR. So that's really part of management and implications. But it's nice to see that at least one person is thinking about putting it right there in the medical record. Actionability, clinical utility is common. Information about testing. Tell me about the clinical validity. Tell me who to test and when to test. Tell me about the test method. Tell me how to interpret the test. Tell me the cost of the test one person called out. Other things for the content. Tell me about the pathophysiology, the phenotype, the prognosis, the whole spectrum of clinical manifestations. What does this thing actually mean? Tell me about the frequency of the variation and especially highlight the most common variants. Two people wanted to know about inheritance patterns or the frequency of a de novo versus inherited mutation. I think it's important to point out that I sent out my, my little survey, and while I mentioned we're asking about genetic variants, most people probably just read, what do you do when you have a genetics question? So some of these answers might not be unique to our question today. Some of them might be, tell me about a genetic disorder. But still, people want to know about inheritance and inherited versus new mutation. Uh, and two people asked for evidence-based information, only two of the now 18 respondents. One of them was a clinician educator, one a clinician researcher, so only two out of 18. What the literature says is clinicians want it to be accurate, they want it to be accessible, they want it to be clinically relevant, and they won't spend more than two minutes looking for answers. And other papers have gone on to say that essentially what clinicians are looking for is a trusted authoritative research that will go out and digest all the primary data and present it to the clinician in a way that they can just use from there. They generally don't want to go look at the evidence themselves. So is evidence-based important? And here I'm reporting not only what I got from my colleagues on my own opinions, but, but this comes in part from uh, email communication with Alan, so this was part of what he was going to tell you also. There's a lot of variation in terms of how much evidence users actually will demand. Some want very high standards, will only implement uh, some action if there's a good randomized clinical trial or better. Others have somewhat less rigorous standards and will use uh, variants when there's a preponderance of evidence that suggests that they're value, uh, valuable. Um, and many people will follow their specialty society guidelines and recommendations. So when a society comes out and makes a statement that actually carries weight. That's good or bad. So for example, outside the realm of genetics, orthopedic societies will tell uh, practitioners that a patient with an artificial joint needs to take antibiotics before they get dental work done. And infectious disease societies say, nonsense, the bugs that cause joint infections in artificial joints are skin organisms, not oral organisms. So this is stupid. Don't give antibiotics before a dental procedure. So do you want to follow the advice of your infectious disease expert or your orthopedics expert? Well, what's the evidence say? Eh, I'm not sure. All right, that's all I got. Great. Questions for Howard? Yeah. Okay. 
Tamoto from uh, University of Utah. Do you get the sense, talking to your colleagues, that your clinician colleagues view genetic information any differently than other information, or do you do you get the sense that you know, just like any other test, any other factor to consider in clinical medicine, they just want to be to be given right. information on well, what should I do with this? So, so as Mark pointed out, we've all in this room done a great job of building up genetic exceptionalism, um, much to our own chagrin. Uh, most geneticists just want to treat it, sorry, most clinicians just want to treat it like any other information with the caveat that they're aware that there's some bugaboo about it and we need to be careful about something. And generally what that typically translates into is, gosh, that's complicated. I better just refer to a geneticist and not touch it, which is also not so helpful because there aren't enough of us geneticists out there. Yeah. Um, so what do your non-genetics clinical colleagues make of the classification probably causal? What do they make of probably causal? How useful is that to them? Uh, I equate that to uh, when we would look for pulmonary embolism before we had good CTs and we'd send our patients down to radiology for a nuclear medicine scan and the report would come back, moderate probability, please correlate with clinical suspicion. Which basically meant, yeah, we don't know, might be, might not be. And it was completely useless. So you put everybody on heparin, and you waited to see if they really had a problem or not. And we probably caused a lot of bleeding uh, problems in people who didn't really need to be heparinized because they didn't have a pulmonary embolism. So no, it's not so helpful to say uncertain significance, but it's better than saying a benign variant is pathogenic, and it's clearly better than saying a pathogenic variant is benign. So while it's not great to say we have no clue what this means, I think it's better than lying. It's probably about as useful as the... Uh uh, entry after Earth and the Hitchhiker's Guide, mostly harmless. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the update. So it, the encyclopedia originally said harmless, and the update was to add mostly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Terry Minolio from, from Genome. Um, it was interesting in the, the list of information that people wanted about um, a, a, vari a variant didn't include cost of the test or where you can get it. And, and I, I practice over at the Navy, and, and boy, trying to figure out how to even order these things is, is really a challenge. So it is. Is that something that you think would be useful to? So one person oh, did sorry. ask for cost. Sorry. Uh, nobody specifically asked where to go to get a test. Uh, but there was when and who to test and test methods. So I think people danced around it. Remember, this was yesterday, and I said spend no more than 30 to 60 seconds answering this question. So again, it's not a very scientific study. Right, and I'm not criticizing your respondents or you. I'm, yeah. I'm just asking you for your opinion. Do, do you find that your folks at Hopkins, being a tertiary care referral center, yeah. that where is not a problem, that they just do it at Hopkins, or, or is this really a challenge? So I guess a little bit more about the sample size or, or sample population. I surveyed general internal medicine folks. I didn't survey specialists. Specialists get a relationship with one or two labs. They know where to get their test. They do it. It's auto magic. Uh, generalists don't have a relationship, and I think that is another barrier that even if you have an idea of what test you want to get, it's so hard to figure out where to get it and fill out all the paperwork that it probably doesn't happen. And in fact, when I'm seeing patients in my primary care office without a genetic counselor, I have a much higher threshold to order a test than when I'm seeing someone in genetics clinic with a counselor because I got to fill out all the paperwork and figure out where I'm going to send it off. So even someone who's informed, it's a barrier. Just to add on to that, um, uh, I think this is a, this is a big issue, but um, uh, as we develop these resources, I think there's a couple of other barriers. Um, one uh, relating to cost where with the genetic testing registry that's coming online, that there was a lot of pushback from clinical laboratories about actually uh, submitting their um, test cost data to that resource. Uh, not all of them were really uh, thrilled about the idea that that would be out there. The other thing that uh, Elaine didn't talk about but I think is, is really critically important in a discussion like this is that some people treat their uh, test specific information as proprietary and use that as a competitive advantage, which I think in the long run is going to be extraordinarily harmful uh, to this type of effort. So I think those are things that we, as we think about what is going to be in the resource, how do we incent people to, uh, to really do this? And if I could just add to that, you know, I, I think this whole discussion highlights the need for us to be thinking about the day when either the whole sequence is there or a variant table is there because it completely makes all those issues go away. Great. So if we move on to our last speaker now before the general discussion. Um, so we